For centuries, India was the fabled land of untold riches. And stories of its wealth, spices, silk, cotton and gold spread far and wide. Travelers and traders from distant lands made the journey to India across deserts, seas, and through snow-bound passes in the Himalayas. The Himalayas are among the highest mountains on Earth and have given India many rivers, the Brahmaputra, Indus, Yamuna, and the most sacred river of all, the Ganga. Along these rivers, great civilizations came up. Lothal in the west, was a thriving port of the great Harappan in this period of about 2600 BC. Dholavira was another highly developed city of the time with well-planned civic amenities and water harvesting. Perhaps one of the oldest democratic republics in the world is Vaishali which dates back to the 6th century BC. Nalanda was a flourishing university as early as the 5th century AD. With residential facilities for 10,000 students and a three stories high library, it attracted scholars from countries like China and Japan. Centuries ago, India gave the world Ayurveda or the science of life. Aryabhat, the concept of zero, and one of the earliest theses on the solar system. And Sushruta, in the 6th century BC, practiced surgery. Philosophers gave guidelines in meditation and yoga. Here in Varanasi, one of the oldest living cities, many of these subjects are still taught in the university. <laughs> Hinduism is one of the oldest religions in the world. Hindus believe in the eternal, the formless, with neither beginning nor end. Hinduism essentially is a way of life that can help to understand the eternal truth. It attributes divinity to all the elements, nature and all things living. Temples dot the subcontinent, from the Badrinath Temple in the Himalayas to the Somnath Temple on the western coast. Attacked and plundered 17 times in the 11th century, it stands proud and resurgent even today. In Thanjavur, in the south, this magnificent temple was built by the Chola king Raja Rajeshwar in the year 1010 AD. The lavishly embellished temple in Madurai is dedicated to Shiva and his consort. Other ancient temples along the southeastern coast date back to the 8th century AD.
Buddhism was born in India in the 5th century BC. Gautam Siddharth was the prince who became an ascetic. He meditated under the Bodhi tree here in Bodhgaya for 49 days and nights. He then gained enlightenment and became known as the Buddha. From India, Buddhism spread first to the Himalayas and then beyond to countries like China, Japan and Korea. At about the same time, Lord Mahavira gave the world Jainism. Lord Mahavira's teachings were strongly based on non-violence. He spoke of the path of right belief, right knowledge and right conduct. Intricately carved marble temples are testimony to the love of his myriad devotees. Islam arrived along the western coast as early as the 7th century. Today, India has the second largest number of Muslims in the world. Muslims believe in the one God, Allah, and the Islamic teachings speak of love, brotherhood, and equality among all men. Sufism is the mystic aspect of Islam. There was only the one God, but the roots to him were many and varied. This allowed for a co-mingling of Hinduism and Islam and found wide acceptance, so that here at the shrine of Hazrat Nizamuddin Aulia in Delhi, people of different faiths come to offer prayers. This church of St. Francis in Kochi was originally built in 1503. It is one of the oldest, although Christian missionaries had been landing along the west coast even earlier. With about 24 million Christians in the country, Christmas is a major celebration. In the northern state of Punjab in the 15th century, the teachings of Guru Nanak found many followers. The most spectacular symbol of the Sikhs, as his followers are called, is the Golden Temple in Amritsar. Guru Nanak's teachings also emphasize the importance of truth and brotherhood. Many invaders came to India, some even from distant Mongolia. But Babar, who came from Samarkand in the 16th century, made it his home and started the Mughal dynasty. It was continued by his son Humayun, whose tomb in Delhi is a major landmark. But the Mughal Empire reached a zenith under Humayun's son Akbar. Akbar married a Hindu Rajput princess and built a beautiful palace called Jodha Mahal in Agra. Akbar's tolerant and secular beliefs made him extremely popular. The Mughal rule greatly influenced administration, language, cuisine, music, dance, and most visibly, its architecture. Today, the Taj Mahal stands as the eternal symbol of love and the passion of the emperor who built it, Shah Jahan. But by the 18th century, the Mughal Empire went rapidly into decline. The rule of the last emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, was restricted to Shah Jahanabad in the walled city of Delhi, and in 1858, he was formally deposed. The British had been coming to India since the 17th century, but they made major inroads into the mainland from the eastern port city of Calcutta. They came as traders under the East India Company, 
but gradually trade became secondary as their dreams of imperial expansion grew. After Robert Clive won a decisive battle in 1757, the British took over large parts of the country. India at the time was a country of wealthy but warring Maharajas, and the spoils of conquest were irresistible and available. The British were fascinated by this land of great diversity and its magnificent wildlife. India was a land primed with opportunity and soon it became the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. In 1911, the new rulers formally established their capital in Delhi. Although the British brought some changes in rail and road communication, foreign domination was deeply resented. But 200 years of colonial rule could only be an aberration in the history of such an ancient land. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi returned to India in 1915 from South Africa. He set up the Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad from where he met with leaders and freedom fighters. Gandhi gave the world Satyagraha, the insistence on truth. Under him, the freedom movement gained cohesion and became a mass movement whose cornerstones were non-violence and non-cooperation. Gandhi wanted not only political freedom, he wanted a democratic, secular nation with empowerment of women and the underprivileged. His moral rectitude and sacrifices for the country have given him the title of the father of the nation. On the 15th of August, 1947, India became an independent nation. Independence had been won, but the country's problems were far from over. There were few industries and there was a lack of employment, especially in the rural areas. There were frequent droughts and food shortages. The first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, and successive Prime Ministers after him worked at making the country a strong and modern nation. One of their priorities was to make it self-sufficient in food In the decades that followed, there was gradual but steady growth in other development sectors. Gandhi had envisioned progress for the country only through the democratic process. A system that began at the grassroots with village elections, the panchayat. Agati is a distant island in the Arabian Sea. The panchayat system, which has a 33% reservation for women, has helped Umul Kulus to become the chairperson of the panchayat. All the islanders are Muslim, yet 
she moves freely between her duties at home and her work. Illiteracy, especially among girls, was another problem. Their role had always been defined as homemakers, for which education was not believed necessary. It was a mindset that is only now beginning to change. India is a vast country with 22 constitutionally recognized languages and at least 114 others. There are regional, religious and ethnic loyalties. While this has given it enormous cultural diversity, here even minor differences can suddenly snowball. These often gain prominence due to the media, a multitude of lively news-hungry channels. Of course, Media also helps to keep the country connected, especially when there are occasions to celebrate. In recent times, information technology and e-governance are helping to reach out to even remote areas. A farmer in the field can get the latest information on the prices of crops, fertilizer, seeds and weather information. E-governance also provides information to young people for study or work. The southern city of Bengaluru is India's Silicon Valley. Here, IT professionals design, define and deliver technology-enabled business solutions for global leaders in the field. After economic liberalization in the early 1990s, many multinational companies set up offices in India. Many more are planning to take advantage of the growing investment opportunities. Simultaneously, Indian business houses are also acquiring companies abroad. The recent acquisition by Tata of the luxury brand Jaguar is only one such example. One of India's entrepreneurial success stories is the Reliance plant in Jamnagar. It is the world's largest and is an ultra-modern high-tech facility that converts crude oil into high-grade petroleum products. Globalization has meant that more people are traveling than perhaps ever before. Whether for business or pleasure, the number of visitors is growing. Tourists can choose from luxury and boutique hotels to tranquil seaside resorts. has been reinvented as a popular spa treatment. Tourism has found a surprising offshoot in medical tourism. Decades after independence, Many of Gandhi's dreams have been realized. The Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Act provides a hundred days employment to any one member of a rural household. Although the act includes all the underprivileged, nearly one third of the workforce are women. 
but perhaps Gandhi's most cherished dream was to have a democratic, secular nation. This is Srinagar, capital of the northern border state of Jammu and Kashmir. Srinagar has a predominantly Muslim population. 37 kilometers from Srinagar is the small village of Wusan. Amongst its 2,500 strong Muslim population live four Hindu Pandit families. Asha's family is one of them. In the recent elections, Asha was among the four elected to the Panchayat. What makes her story unusual is that the local people find nothing unusual in it. With such an ancient syncretic past, it is no surprise that festivals are celebrated in a kaleidoscope of rhythm and color. Cultural traditions are nurtured and handed down from one generation to the next. As an enviable demographic of young people. The challenge facing the world's largest democracy is to provide education, employment and to bridge the economic disparities that are perhaps inevitable in a country of this size. The multi-dimensional complexities of India often baffle outsiders but the people have learned that their shared cultural heritage can and must transcend religious and regional differences for it is the key to their survival as a nation.